Our scripture lesson today comes from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, and verses 14 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, Have a seat here, please. While to the one who is poor you say, Stand there, or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Be careful about offering the best seat in the house to the person dressed in fine clothes while you offer the poor only a seat on the ground. Do you think James was looking out over a congregation staring into computer and iPhone screens when he said this? Probably not. We know that James is writing a letter. We don't really know where he's writing this letter from or what he might have been looking out over when he said this. But a quick glance at his opening lines, and we know that he is writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. That's what he says, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Were these 12 tribes once one tribe that has now been dispersed in a dozen directions? Maybe they couldn't get along within the tribe anymore, and so they all decided to go their separate ways? Or maybe an enemy twice their size came along. And wanting to get the advantage, wanting to divide and conquer, that's just what they did. Or are they 12 tribes all living in the same basic region of the world, and if not for the fact that they want to remain 12 separate tribes, they could just be one tribe? We don't know. What we do know is that they are 12 tribes. Not 12 churches not 12 families, not 12 Girl Scout troops, not 12 high school baseball teams, but 12 tribes. What do we know about tribes? Well, on their best day, they can provide us with a deep sense of belonging. Our tribe is our culture, our history, the lens through which we see the world and understand our place in it. But on their worst day, tribes can be arrogant, violent, and protective to a fault of what is theirs. It may be that for these 12 tribes, there is a bit of both going on, which is why in his two opening chapters, James has two basic messages for them. One, consider it joy when you face trials of any kind, because you know that the testing of your faith will stretch you and grow you until one day you will be full grown, complete, lacking in nothing. To these 12 tribes, James doesn't say you will have everything. He says you will lack in nothing. There's a difference between having everything and learning that all you have is all you need. If these tribes are at war with each other, if they are competing for the top spot, James seeks to remind them that only a joyful life is a complete life. 
His second message is the one we've already heard. Be careful about offering the best seat in the house to the person dressed in fine clothes while you offer the poor person a seat on the ground. In other words, be careful with your tribalism. Be careful in thinking that you are the person to call the shots over who's in and who's out. Be careful about judging a book by its cover. Be careful in protecting the best seat in the house. For God may show up one day and not even want your best seat. I wonder if, when James said this, he wasn't looking out over an empty field, or maybe he was sitting underneath a tall oak tree. Would you agree that there is a certain equality in sitting outside under the open sky? When you're outside, it's almost impossible to not feel like you are in someone else's house. With the birds overhead and the chipmunks scampering in the underbrush, and nothing to keep the breeze from blowing in or from a complete stranger from walking up and sitting down beside you, when you're outside, it's hard to see whose tribe you belong to. I guess we would have to say, you belong to God's. There's a story that Barbara Brown Taylor tells in her book, Always a Guest, about the visionary priest Pierre de Chardin, who in 1923 wrote his Mass on the World. He wrote it while sitting under a tree in the Ordos Desert in China. It was a long mystical communion prayer in which he celebrated the sacrament of the world. At the time, it was regarded scandalous by most. Scandalous because Deschardins didn't have any bread or any wine with him in the desert. He didn't have anything for anyone to eat or drink. He didn't even have a table or an altar, which is why he set his mass on the world. I will raise myself beyond these symbols, he wrote, up to the pure majesty of the real itself. I, your priest, will make the whole earth my altar, and on it will offer you all the labors and sufferings of the world. Chardin trusted that everything around him was the body and blood of God's word, that everything, including himself, was a consecrated gift of God for the people of God. In his celebration of communion that day, Chardin lorded nothing over anyone and used nothing up. His church and dominion consisted of desert and sky, in his own empty hands as he offered the fruits of God's own creation back to God. In this way, Taylor writes, his altar was the same one Jesus presided over at the hour of his death. There, too, the great high priest held up empty hands, his arms fixed in blessing, as he was lifted along with the world he so loved to God. It is a powerful, equalizing, and perhaps scandalous take on church. But if James is right, the more scandalous the act, the closer we are to God. Be careful about offering the best seat in the house to the person dressed in fine clothes while you offer the poor person a seat on the ground. Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of that kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? In his book, Having Nothing, Possessing Everything, Methodist minister Michael Mather tells a story about a woman named Adele who used to come to the food pantry at his church in Indianapolis every day. So often when we consider the poor, he writes, we see only their need and what we can do for them. We don't think of their gifts. So one day I asked Adele, what is something that you do well and care enough about that you could teach someone else to do it? She said, I'm a good cook. I said, prove it. She asked what I meant and I asked her to cook lunch one day for the custodian, secretary, and me. Adele's lunch was fabulous. Mather goes on to write that shortly after this, the Chamber of Commerce contacted us. They wanted to have an all-day meeting of their leadership group in our church building. And because they were going to be there all day, they wanted to know if they could use the kitchen to make lunch. We told them they could, but we preferred they use our caterer. We introduced them to Adele. And while we were at it, we invested some money to buy her a bunch of business cards. Long story short, 
She handed them out that day and every day thereafter, and a year and a half later, Adele opened Adelita's Fajitas, all with a little help from her church. Mather concludes, If we had asked Adele how poor she was, we all would have ended up being poor for it. The biggest spiritual problem confronting us in the world today is that the poor don't believe they have any gifts and the rich don't believe they have any needs. Be careful about offering the best seat in the house to the person dressed in fine clothes while you offer the poor a seat on the ground. Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor of the earth to be rich in faith and to be heirs of that kingdom which God has promised? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? One of the most enduring experiences I've ever had of church came to me in the summer of 2005 when I was a pastoral intern at Fourth Presbyterian Church in Boston, located just two blocks from the Andrew Square tea stop Fourth, as the locals like to call it, sits in the projects of Southie. The pastor at that time, who is still the pastor there, is a white male jazz playing pianist who graduated from Harvard Divinity School and who seems to know every kid and family who lives within an eight block radius of the church. Consequently, it seemed to me that the church was comprised of six figure making professors from Harvard, first year students from the Berkeley College of Music, and homeless people who came more for the food pantry than for the preaching, along with Spanish-speaking migrants who would always say that the music sounded a bit like home to them. Anyway, on this one particular hot Sunday in July, we arrived at church only to discover that the deacon who was supposed to bring the communion bread that day had forgotten to. With minutes to go before the service was to begin, the pastor pulled a few dollars out of his pocket and handed it to another deacon who, let's just say, was not one of the six-figure-making professors in the bunch. This deacon was an adult with some learning disabilities, who at the age of 56 still lived with his mother in a two-bedroom high-rise just one block away from the church. Take this down to the corner store and buy us a loaf of bread. When you bring it back, the service will have started already. But just bring the bread in and slip it under the napkin on the table. So that's what this deacon did. Off he went, soon to return. He came into the sanctuary and did just as he was told. He slipped the loaf of bread underneath the napkin on the table. Not until it came time for communion, however, did we see what had really been done. There it was, sitting before us, a loaf of frozen garlic bread. Now, did I mention that it was a hot Sunday in July and that the church had no air conditioning? Wiser pastors, I suppose, would apologize to the congregation. I'm sorry, but we're not going to be able to celebrate communion today after all. But not this pastor. This pastor went over to the communion table, our altar in the hot desert, and slipped the loaf out of its tin foil bag. Butter dripped everywhere. All over his hands, it trickled down onto the table and then went like a stream falling onto the red carpet below. The pastor lifted the loaf of bread in the air. You could see the color of yellow seeping through the white cuffs of his dress shirt as the smell of garlic filled the air. This is the gift of God, he declared. Of course, everyone who was in church that day knew that what he really meant was, this is the gift from God, straight from the very heart of God. Be careful about offering the best seat in the house to the person dressed in fine clothes, while you offer the poor person only a seat on the ground. Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor of the earth to be rich in faith and to be heirs of that kingdom which God has promised? I won't hesitate to ask you if you would like to move your seat 
at this time. Amen. You've been hearing, I've seen you hide in fear, embarrassed by your weaknesses, afraid to let me near. I wish you knew how much I love for you to understand. No matter what may happen, child, I'll never let go of your hand. You've been forsaken by all you've known before. When you fail their expectations, they frown and close the door. But even though your heart itself should lose the will to stand, no matter what may happen, child, I'll never let go of your hand. Life that I have given you, no one can take away. I've sealed it with my spirit, blood and word. The everlasting Father has made his covenant with you. And he's stronger than the world you've seen and heard. fear to show them all the love I have for you. I'll be with you everywhere in everything you do. And even if you do it wrong and miss the joy I've planned, I'll never, never let go of your hand. life that I have given you, no one can take away. I've sealed it with my spirit, blood and word. The everlasting Father has made his covenant with you, and he's stronger than the world you've seen and heard. Fear to show them all the love I have for you. I'll be with you everywhere in everything you do. And even if you do it wrong and miss the joy I planned, I'll never, never let go of you. wrong and miss the joy I planned. I'll never, never let go of your hand. I'll never let go of your hand. Go forth this day, my friends, and may you offer your seat to those who have no bread, those who have no place at the table, those who do not know already that they belong and they are loved. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit go before you, behind you, within you, and all around you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>